Well, hey, everybody, and welcome back to the third episode of this new video series called The Breakdown, where we are taking some time, uh, me and Eric here, to break down the message from the past weekend and bring up some points that maybe we didn't have some time for, or maybe dig into something a little bit deeper that we maybe didn't have time for um, in the message as well. So um, here we are, Yeah. video number welcome three. Back. I think I, it's been going pretty well. Yeah, it's been good. I like that you, before when we prayed, that you prayed that you'd do a better <laughs> intro. <laughs> that was awesome. I'm still working on that. Yeah. So. <laughs> I also liked the picture, the little thumbnail on this video, the podcast, Yeah. because it's got you laughing oh, really yeah. hard. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, I thought that was a good capture of, uh, of how it feels in here. I love this space. I love the way we're talking. Yeah. It's been really good. So, yeah, well awesome. done on this so far. Well, thank you. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, I think we got some really good questions here today, and I think we'll be able to kind of um, stick around maybe like one or two topics. I know last week we kind of like covered a lot of hard ones. Yeah. So we're kind of like yeah. bouncing around. So I dig it. Well, why don't I kick us off with the first one here? So it. this is kind of like a religion versus relationship thing. Okay. So it says, I think we know in theory that being religious isn't the goal. A relationship with Jesus is. But day in and day out, it's hard to separate those. So I think the newlywed story helped us make that really practical. Mm -hmm. That thing you brought up with uh, going back to the kid's house to do all of the things that he did growing up and when he's married, which is very strange. So that was a good point. <laughs> um, can you delve into more of the contrast between freedom and the law using that example? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely I can. So here's here's where I would kind of pivot into that is there, it, and it's using my own marriage, my wife, Erica, and I, um, every week we have date night. Every week and uh, every Thursday night. Now when we were uh, when we were youth pastors and we was super po and couldn't afford much and we, we couldn't afford to go out, we couldn't afford to go out and have a babysitter and all this, we started doing date night at home. Uh, it stemmed out of uh, must-see TV on Thursday night uh, from when we were very much newlyweds. Before we had kids, we'd get Subway and we would uh, eat dinner together and, and we recorded on VHS our shows like, you know, Frasier and Friends and different things and we'd watch those together. And it was just a lot of fun. And it evolved into date night. Um, one time we watched Iron Chef and they had battle goat cheese and we were like, oh. Let's try goat cheese. And our date night dinner began with that simple little thing. And what it became for us was this thing that we do every week. We never miss date night. It, it's very strange if we do. Um, sometimes our kids' sports get in the way or things like that. But, but date night is this thing we do. We, we enjoy it so much, we started doing half date night, which is Sunday night where after everything's kind of settled down from the craziness of the weekend, you know, being pastors and teaching Saturday and Sunday and uh, everything going on, we usually just had a late dinner, her and I, and uh, we'd maybe watch something later in the evening. But here's the thing, it could get very religious. Okay, we've got to do date night. We've got to do date night. It's got to have these elements. We have a very specific menu. It's funny, we, it's, it's like our little tradition, right? And uh, when something's missing, it's not like, you know, Erica would look at me and be like, usually I make date night. She's not going to be like, oh, this isn't date night. What's wrong with you? No. We may talk about something missing, but it, it, it's not a requirement to have, uh, let's say, you know, this one thing to have date night. Date night is about the relationship and unplugging. The phones stay upstairs. Uh, the kids basically avoid us like the plague because they know. <laughs> and if they ever come and like catch us, like they're like, hey, the, as they come down the stairs, I'm sorry, I know it's date night. I'm sorry to interrupt. And they know the rules around it are actually there because there is something relational about it. It's so relational. It's all about being together. And that's where I think um, the difference is between doing something because you have to and doing something because it blesses, guards, and builds your relationship. That's the difference between religion and law. Like we, we do date night, we do these things, and I would say we do it religiously on Thursday nights. Like think of it, are there any events going on in this church 
that involve me on a Thursday night since you've been here? No. No, no there yeah, absolutely no. isn't. That is the only night of the week where it's like, don't, don't ask, don't, like, I would like to write a letter to Zealand schools and be like, don't schedule anything on Thursday nights. We have plans, and there's times where we don't get to eat dinner till 9.30, but the dinner's the same, and we're down there, and, and we have dinner together. It's date night. We do it because we love that connection, and when it starts earlier, awesome. If it doesn't start till later, it's still awesome. We're going to make the most of it. It's not about everything being perfect. It's about the fact that this is our thing, and we we love each other, and it's a sign of our love that we push everything to the margins, and we're like, no, it's just us on this night. It's just the two of us, and, um, and I think it prepares us for a life after our kids have grown up and moved out. It's not yeah, going to be weird point. to sit and have dinner with just Erica. I do that two nights a week. Just the two of us eat together. Why? Because we love that relationship, so we carve out and make time for it, and we carve out special things, special things to eat and be around each other. Like yesterday, she, um, she made French onion soup and these little uh, meringue things. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> and for me, like I saw her cooking yesterday, and she was doing all this stuff, and I was like, oh, it smells so good. It meant so much to me that she took all the time to invest in that four-hour stretch of our life. You know, last night, Sunday night, half date night, she really made an effort and it was so much fun. And I just kept saying to her, thank you, it was so good. I really enjoyed it because effort speaks to value. We say that at the Foundry Church. In relationship, effort speaks to value. And she showed that effort and it just totally blessed my whole day and made me so happy that she thought about me and made something she thought I would like and she wanted to have it with me. We don't go eat it in separate rooms. It's, it's something about coming together. So when we talk about religion and law versus relationship, the problem is you can go through the motions and it can look like date night, but if you're not there to connect with the person, you might as well be eating in separate rooms, right? That's, that's the heart of it. It's all about relationship. The cross is because God wanted to be back in relationship with us. So he did these things. He established the law. He fulfilled the law. He died our death in order to raise us into his life. It's all for relationship. Now, Scripture speaks to what uh, good decisions in a moral life is. Absolutely, but, but it's about relationship. And I, because of my relationship with Erica, I live differently as a man, morally, right? I live very differently. Why? Because of that appreciation for her. And I will tell you this, out of that has grown an appreciation for what the Lord Jesus Christ did for me. And in my life currently, and hopefully forevermore, I'm not living morally as a good man for my wife. I'm doing it because in that relationship, oh, I learned that it, it builds my relationship with God to live a life that honors him. I'm trying to honor him with my life. I'm trying to do something that builds relationship. And I learned that in marriage. I learned it with my wife, like that builds that trust and the connection and the closeness, it's not all emotion. It's not all feeling. There's a great deal of intimacy that doesn't have all the feeling. There's just a deep bond. And when you have that with God, you're not doing it because you have to. You're doing it because you love him. You're doing it because you know how much he loves you. And you want to have that time together. There are times even with our date night where it's like, oh man, getting down there at 9.30. You're kind of so hungry, you're done being hungry. And you feel like, oh, and we'll go down and we'll end up having a great evening together. Even though at first it felt like, wow, it's so late, I'm so tired. But when you get down there and you make the choice to invest, it's just wonderful. It's just wonderful. So I think having your eyes on relational value changes the way you live the structures of your life. This is a long answer. Nice, Sorry. yeah, no. Why don't we jump right into the, the next one because I think this is um, kind of revolves around something similar. So we don't need to live under a bunch of rules, yet we tell people to do their devotions, to spend time in prayer, to be in worship, etc. So how do you know if you're just following rules 
or really forming a relationship with Jesus. So here's the thing. If, if I took, so if I have these rules, I'm a visual person. If I have these rules here, I'm just thinking out loud. Mm-hmm. And I do these things because I, I don't know, it makes me feel like I'm, I'm connected to God. Mm-hmm. And if I'm only following rules to feel connected from God, when I take away the rules, I will actually feel more free because I still won't have a connection with God, mm. right? Following rules doesn't give us a connection with God. It is, it is something we do in our head that makes us feel like maybe we're approved, but your approval to God is in Christ alone. So mm. in following rules to be close to God, you could cut out all the rules, quit following all the rules, and you won't feel any further or closer to God because of it. Mm. Because the rules weren't meeting the goal. Maybe at a psychological level, the placebo effect, you'll feel like, oh yeah, you know, I'm doing this and God loves me more. But the reality is, you'll feel more freedom throwing a bunch of rules away if you were only having rules to earn God's favor. Because you weren't earning God's favor. It wasn't doing you any favors to follow these rules if it wasn't to be in relationship with him. And I would say to be in relationship with him it, it has nothing to do with rules. It has everything to do with opening up. It's a vulnerability that you're sinful, that you're helpless, and you're in need of what God has, his righteousness, and you can only receive it by him. It's a very vulnerable place to be in. And so to open yourself up and say, here's my sin and my shame and my past, you said you would take it, I believe you, and give that to him. It's a very connective thing to confess like that. And then to be forgiven. There's nothing like the look on someone's face when they're a new Christian. And they come out of that sinner's prayer and they're free. And you can see it. They didn't follow any rules. They came to Jesus. If you follow rules to be close to God... Here's what I would challenge you to do. Cut out all the rules you follow and see if you feel any further or closer to God. I don't think you'll feel closer to God um, following rules. I, I just don't think that's true because rules are a construct we make to feel like we're moral. Our morality is totally broken. So being good moral people doesn't change our closeness to God. Christ changes it, a relationship with Jesus. Like, have you ever gotten into a new dating relationship? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, but isn't it wonderful? Yeah. Like all these feelings and there's nothing wrong with that person. You look at me like, I just adore you. It's so good, right? That is a great thing. That is infatuation and infatuation matters because there's so much about you that isn't um, compatible so all the emotion, all the feeling, all this wonder is, um, it gives you, it's the early soil, the soft soil a relationship can grow roots in and, and begin to blossom. In the same way with Christ, when we come to him and we have this moment of forgiveness and it's almost like infatuation, we just want to please him. You know, we think about him and we do things because we know it matters. And we know how much, how good it feels to know Jesus and be a Christian. It's infatuation in a way. But what it is, is it's the early soil where a deep abiding love for Jesus Christ can grow. The problem isn't God not loving us, it's us returning true love to God. So when we don't feel like being a good Christian, do we love Jesus enough at a core level to stay faithful, to believe that being in the word of God is still valuable? Not because you have to, but because that's where you meet with him. That's where you go to spend time and, you, and you, you learn the language of God. So to me, it's very much this tenderness of God knowing how we're wired 
and the kind of soil love grows out of. And so when I, when, I, when I look at that question, it's like we tell you to do devotions and spend time in prayer. It's not like just do this and do this so you're done for the day. It's do this, listen, and ask, is God saying anything to me? What's God speaking to me? If he loves me, what, what is he saying over my day? If I'm in pain right now, what does his love feel like and how does it speak out of his word? What, what is it like to sit and listen to the Lord Jesus Christ? Sitting in silence in prayer and just letting all the madness of your day, of your life, pass away. And then there's the, the close, quiet comfort of being silent with someone you love. Mm. I think I talked about that a couple weeks I ago think with so, Oswald, yeah. you know, the silence of God, that, that you're an intimate when you can be in the silence of God. My, my hope for people is that you'll move beyond infatuation, this sense of, of being like, oh, wow, this really feels good to be close to Jesus to the point where it's like, this is my life to mm. be close to Jesus. Yeah. It's not a good feeling. It's a wonderful life. I mean, I heard a quote the other day. Where was it? I'm trying to think. Um, a guy was talking about C.S. Lewis, uh, how he quoted, you know, kind of, kind of walking with with God, and it was this quote around uh, where C.S. Lewis said, like, basically, it's no fun at all. It's no fun at all. Nobody thinks it's fun to be smashed in the face and knocked down, like this conviction, right? It's not. It's amazing how the conviction of God can be so life-altering and change who we are, yet because he loves us in that abiding relationship, we find ourselves safe in the presence of one who's willing to say a difficult thing into our life in order that the best thing happen. God doesn't call us to, to this just good thing. He calls us to transformation, the best thing. So many good things die in the process, and I think it dies in the process when the process is being in the word of God, being in prayer, being in relationship with him, pouring your heart out to him. I find myself doing that an awful lot. Mm. So yeah, that's what I would say is, you're not just following rules, you're meeting God on the park bench of your life. And yeah, maybe it's a standing appointment every morning where you just get up and you go to that place. I mean, that song, the one, I come to the garden alone, you know, when the dew is still on the roses. I don't that, think I've heard that yeah, before. Yeah, it's an old hymn. Huh. It was my grandpa Folker's favorite hymn. Um, and and the, the chorus goes, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own. What does that garden signify? It signifies a place where we walk in the bounty and the richness of a relationship with Jesus. And we do it in this still, quiet moment where everything is pushed away so that we can walk with him, we can talk with him. And I love the refrain of that hymn, and he tells me I am his. The world's gonna try to redefine who we belong to, but those times when Jesus reminds us, you belong to me. I love you, I bought you, and I've got a purpose for you that is so wonderful, so wonderful. And you're meant to be, you know, used for a purpose. And I think that's very, very true that many of us feel, feel an anxiety or a sorrow over not being well used in life. But I think many of us would feel very sad if we picked up, a, you know, one of those wonderful ancient uh, violins that's from the, you know, that maybe Vivaldi or one of those guys played. And we played tennis with it. <laughs> because it looked like a tennis racket. Well, I guess it works for that. Maybe it'll work for a while, but it'll work at the expense of this beautiful thing. And I think many of us spend our lives like using our life like that violin. It was meant to do something beautiful and wonderful. It's not a tennis racket. It was a violin. Don't mistake shape. For purpose, right? And sometimes we're like, well, I think I'm supposed to do this because I'm, I'm this type of person. Well, what if God intended you for something else? Where are you supposed to find what, what you're supposed to be? It's in those moments, those moments of knowing the word of God, of being soaked in the word of God, taking on the word of God in prayer with the Lord Jesus Christ so that when someone comes to you and speaks into your life, all of a sudden, 
You're like, oh, they don't know they're speaking into your purpose, but they are. Where does that come from? In the word of God. I mean, I have one experience where this happened, Kyle. Um, I did my discipleship training school with Youth with a Mission uh, in Harpenden, England at the Highfield Oval. What up? And um, I loved it. But when I first got there, I hated it. I hated it. I'll never forget, I, I saw a sign when I was getting on the, the tube there in London, and it said, mind your head. And I was like, well, of course you mind your head. But it basically said, watch your head, don't bump it. And I was yeah. like, so to me, I was like, what is wrong? No wonder we revolted, you know, which, by the way, I super love the British now. I'm so sorry I was <laughs> such an American. I mean, I love being an American, don't get me wrong, but I was so offensive in my, in my way when I got there. But I wanted to go home so bad. So bad. I was homesick at a toothache level. It radiated through my whole being. And um, I was praying and I said, uh, Lord, can you help me? And I did. I was a new Christian. Um, I'd been raised in a Christian home, but I was a young new Christian. I was 21. I opened my Bible the theologian's way, closed my eyes, like, speak <laughs> oh, to yeah. me, would you, you know? And I put my finger on a verse. And, um, and it, was, it was a wonderful verse. It was where Jesus was in the garden the night he was betrayed. And he walked a little ways and he fell forward and he said, um, God, may this cup be taken from me, but not as I will, as you will. And I was like, oh, I made a mistake, you know, and I closed <laughs> my Bible. I didn't believe. I was like, that was just random. It wasn't supposed to be that. And then um, I was literally just kind of slogging across this grass field. And this guy, a chipper missionary, those guys, he comes jogging up to me. He's like, hey, are you part of the new DTS? And I'm like, yes. You know, <laughs> full of joy, of course. And he's like, oh, man, how you doing? I'm like, dude, I just want to go home. I want to go home so bad. He's like, really? Oh, I'm sorry. Can I pray for you? And I was like, oh, missionaries <laughs> and all their prayer. And I was, oh, it was so brutal. I just wanted to go home. I was like, yeah, can you pray for me to go home? And he's like, oh, yeah, let me pray for you. So he puts his hand on me, and I'm like, why are we touching him? And he like, <laughs> puts his hand on me, he starts praying for me. And he's just praying this really nice prayer. He's a really gracious, good guy. And he said, and Lord, I just pray that... Um, that out of Eric would, would come this, this prayer, that not my will, Lord, but yours be done. And my eyes were like, tang, because <laughs> I didn't really read my Bible before that. I didn't know how to read the Bible, you know? I knew it was there, and I knew the stories, but, you know, what do you do when Samson eats honey out of a dead lion, and what does that mean? So I didn't really spend time in the Word, but I did have that one verse from playing biblical that you just roulette read. that yeah. I just read. And, like, five minutes later, this dude's quoting that verse back into my ear, and I knew I couldn't go home. I knew I couldn't go home, and I was, can you say pissed? I was pissed. <laughs> I was not happy. I was like, crap, I don't want to stay. I don't want to do this. But what did I have? I had the word of the Lord that I was where I was supposed to be. I didn't go home. My, the first of my grandparents died. My grandpa Folkers, who I mentioned with the hymn. Yep. It's Grandpa Folkers Day. Um, he passed away when I was at my DTS. And my parents said, you can come home for the funeral. I said, if I come home, I will never come back. And I didn't go home for his funeral. And it was one of the great sacrifices of my life. And I would say this, that decision was rooted in Scripture. Mm. Not my will, but yours be done. I mean, it's just a simple little verse. But every time I read it, I remember that that, that Scripture spoke to me. That was the only time I'd ever really been in Scripture on my own looking for a word from God. And he spoke pretty clearly. Yeah. And here I am, you know, 26 years. Is it 26? No, it can't be that long. I, think I haven't even been alive that yeah, long. Shut <laughs> off, Kyle. <laughs> Kyle. Um, That's so brutal. Yeah, it's, it was 26 years ago that that was spoken uh, from the Lord and then from that missionary and ruined my whole day. It was not my favorite part of my day, but here's the thing. I'm so thankful God spoke into it because it started me on a long obedience in that one direction, following God in mission. Um, as he proved, he loved me. And uh, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't know that I've had a ton of times where scripture spoke that clearly again, but I have a want to go back to that place. Uh, it's my infatuation moment. It's where I knew that Jesus loved me and I could trust him even if I didn't like where I was at. So I would say being in the Word of God, it's the kindest thing we could do 
is to tell people. My thing would be, and this is crazy, I don't like hearing it, but I'm gonna say it. Don't come to church and get fed some experience that you're not gonna apply to your life. If you're gonna do one thing, get in the word of God. Mm. Now, I believe in the three part, right? The, oh, of course. The walk, walk with the Lord on your own, stand with other believers, be in church, hear the word of God, and, um, and be part of that. And then be in groups where you discuss it. We really weave that content together here where our devotions are related to our teaching, which is related to our group's material. I think that's important. But the most important thing you can do as a Christian, get in your Bible. You be in the Bible. Mm. Like you, you, we are priest and prophet to one another. You should be in your Bible, not as a duty, but as the greatest opportunity. You are literally holding the words of Almighty God in your hand. Mm -hmm. He chose to write it over thousands of years, dozens of different authors, all these things pointing to one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what God put in the scriptures. So when we look at that, we can understand the power of the word of God. And you have that one example of even my my life where God spoke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So with all these stories, I just thought of something. I know I said to, it was either my dad, my mom, maybe both when I was a kid, doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> but I had said, uh, okay, um, I don't remember where it came from, but I asked them, so what would it be like if the only thing I did was stayed inside and read my Bible? Like, is that like the best thing I can do is to just like stay inside all day, read my Bible and pray? Yeah. I don't know. What do you think of that? <laughs> okay. So um, did you have big imagination when you were a kid? I still do. Yeah, I like to think do. so yeah. at least. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so let me answer the question by saying this. I don't think it's possible. I don't think it's possible to sit and read Scripture and just stay in a room unless forcibly kept. Right, But even the Apostle Paul, when forcibly kept, knowing Scripture, what did he do? He just converted everybody around him. Yeah, he yeah. shared the gospel. Here's what I would say. When you're a little kid and you watch, like I, for me, it was the Karate Kid. Have you ever seen the original oh, Karate course. Kid? Like, I've seen both. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. That was the crane kick. And it's like, oh, when he does the crane kick, none can defense. It was awesome. Um, so when I watched the Karate Kid, guess what I played for the next number of months? You're the best around. Yeah, woo. Nothing's good. Oh, yeah. yeah wax <laughs> That's on, a wax good one. off. Like we did all this stuff. I had my uh, friend of mine, uh, Brent Parsley, I think he's a pastor in uh, Texas, but his name was Brent, and uh, his name is um, Brent. I, I hope he's still around. <laughs> I think he is. <laughs> um, but uh, Brent and I were playing Karate Kid. And I was uh, one of the Cobra Kai guys, you know. We we're on my trampoline, and there's a move. You can see this in the very first, um, first Karate Kid where he does this side kick, and he kind of kicks up, and it's about like seven-eighths of a kick. His yeah. leg comes up, and then he pulls it right back down to his other foot, and right as it gets back down, it snaps out and just tags the dude yeah. right in the face. Yeah. It was a great kick, and I remember seeing it, and I was like, I'm gonna learn how to do it. And I wore these awesome Adidas sweatpants because they kind of made me feel like a ninja, <laughs> and I could do this kick. And Brent and I were on the trampoline, and we were in the middle of the, like, the valley tournament, you know, and we're just playing, and I reach up and kind of do this. Well, he thinks that's his moment, and he comes at me. I kicked that dude in the face so hard. I, he dropped like a bag of hammers. Blood everywhere. I'm like, oh, it oh, works. Man. It was dope. I loved it. I drilled him. But why? I had seen someone do it, and I wanted to be part of the story. You can't look at the story of God in isolation and not want to get it out. You want to play your part. There is a part of us that, um, that really needs the imagination of ministry that says, oh my goodness, like I can't just sit and read this and be like, oh, well, that's good. And do nothing with it. Mm -hmm. Something we, we want to believe ourselves as part of the story. Like in a weird way, isn't that grace? That God gives us these stories and says, and you're part of that great lineage of faith. You're part, you're one of the characters of the lineage of faith. 
you are part of the story. He doesn't call us just to receive. He calls us to go and make disciples. He calls us to be made into his image. I mean, the wax on, wax off um, thing of little Daniel son learning how to be a karate expert or a black belt. I don't know if they're actually, anyways. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but all these things he did that made no sense to him to become something, a lot of what we're doing when we sit and we read scripture, we don't realize the things it's putting into our life. And eventually what has to happen is we've got to put it to use. It's got to come out. It's got to come out, and it's going to come out of us. We talk about, you know, springs of living water. When the Holy Spirit fills us, and we can see by the Spirit's wisdom and vision what's going on in Scripture and our part to play in it, yeah, you can't restrain that. You can't dam that up and stop it from flowing out of your life. It's going to get out. My question would be, how then do we release all this to come out of our lives? Mm. How do we stop, you know, just playing the game of Christianity and recognize that there is an imaginative, playful, fully alive us in being part of the biblical story? So my question would be, no way could you just read it in your room, though the the initial impulse of it is, I'm going to do this one thing that if I did this, I wonder what would happen. And I would say what would happen is out of that life would begin to flow rivers of living water. Because to be steeped in the word of God, like when you put hot water and then you take a tea bag and put it in, cover it, what you have afterwards is no longer, nobody calls it hot water. They call it what it's become by the ingredients in that thing that was mm. steeped in the tea. Mm. And that the color has changed, the flavor has changed. Why? Because something was put into it that is transformative. Same thing with the Holy Spirit in us. When the Spirit of God is in us, we are steeped in the Word of God. When we're in the Word of God and filled with the Holy Spirit, we begin to take on the essence of Christ and we become a Christian a Christ follower. So yeah, to me, that would be my answer to that question. Mm. And we got to talk about Karate Kid. Yeah. Oh man. You that. ever seen the one with uh, Jaden Smith? I did. That one was pretty was good pretty too. Solid. Yeah. yeah. Usually those aren't that good, but like, I like Jaden Smith and I like Jackie Chan. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh my word. How he did was I forget Mr. that Miyagi. Jackie Chan was in it? Yeah. Oh my no, word. No, it's okay. I yeah. forgive you. Oh, so good. Yeah. I almost thought they were kind of like because I've seen them both. I haven't seen any of like the cruddy sequels to the original. Oh, you haven't? But uh, no. Oh no. man, that is so good. Because yeah, because like Ralph Macchio falls in love with Elizabeth Shue in the first one. She was his girlfriend. Okay. Super had a crush on her when I was young. I was oh, yeah, that was hilarious. And then he falls in love. Ralph Macchio falls in love with a girl from Okinawa. Uh oh. The second one. Love yeah. triangle. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> and then I uh, Karate Kid 3, I don't even remember what happens, but there's a beat down somewhere. And it was awesome. Huh. I just, I loved all the Karate Kid movies. Reminds me of Rocky, too. Oh. Like, I've never seen Rocky, any oh, of the Rockies. You've never seen I Rocky? No. What? And I'm a film person, too. It's like, I'm oh supposed to God. see all this stuff. And... I feel like, I'm, yeah, it's like, what? <laughs> Who's the real would... film buff here? Yeah. <laughs> Who's not shaped like Rocky? <laughs> me. Oh, neither am I, so. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, cool. Why don't we um, move on to a third question that we've got here? How so. have you not seen Rocky? I don't oh know. my gosh! Oh, I, I didn't grow up know. around that time. Oh. I don't know. Well, clearly, <laughs> my adult vision in the Word of God came before you were born. I'm like, oh, so old. I was 21. Oh my gosh. Uh, all all right. right. So, wow, we were in sync there. So, mm. <laughs> <laughs> checklist versus grace. So, this is kind of like the same question, but on yeah. like a different matter. So, James says faith without works is dead. And I think that's a very interesting verse that can then also kind of be taken out of context easily too. So, I think you'd have some good insight in this. Um, but on the other hand, people act like focusing on good works is wrong. So, how do I serve God without getting caught up in religion? That's a good question. All right, so let's do it this way. Um, like, have you ever gotten a gift, like maybe an exchange gift in class, and the person knew who they were giving it to, and they just like, like, here you go. And you're like, dude, this is a strawberry shortcake book. Like, you didn't even <laughs> think about this. Yeah, but I did what I had to do. 
Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And you're like, well, yeah, you did, but when I opened it, I was sad right here because I don't like strawberry shortcake. Well, the dessert, yes, but the the, the doll, right? You know strawberry. Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. Uh -huh. So, like, if somebody had a gift exchange with you, and they're like, here you go, and you're like, awesome, and you watch them open their gift, and let's say they're like, they're like a crazy, I don't know, they like bass fishing or something, and you got them a set of like lures and, or jigs for, um, for bass fishing, and you wrote something to them, you said, I know you said at this lake, like these, these bass only hit on these. I know they're expensive, but I hope you go out and knock them dead. Have a great time fishing. Like, wow, man, that's a really personal gift. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, I would say that's good relational work right there, right? Mm -hmm. And then they looked at you and like, okay, sorry, um, I've been busy, and on my way here, I grabbed your gift. And it's wrapped in a T-shirt from the back seat of their car. And you're like, okay. And you open it, and it's strawberry, you know, strawberry shortcake. And you're like, how's... I'm how's, getting so much secondhand right? embarrassment, and this is fiction. <laughs> well, but just think about it, though. Both of them did what they had to do. Both of them did a good thing. They each got each other a gift. But one was motivated out of a love for the person, a memory of something they shared, and a want for them to go and experience it to the full. That seems like a healthy relationship. The other was like, I got you this. I was on my way here. I got it from a gas station. Sorry, it's all they had thinking of you. And you're like, oh, man. You would think to yourself, dude, save your money. Give me a Slurpee. Yeah. Like, buy me actual strawberry shortcake. <laughs> Don't give me this book. Like, what? one feels so deeply relational. The other was just good works because they had to do it. In the end, what it comes down to is relationship. What The question, how do I serve God without getting caught up in religion? If you're only serving God because you have to, and you're not motivated out of an intrinsic love for him or desire to know him and love people who he loves, then I would say in a lot of ways you're just ticking boxes. And as a pastor in a church where we need people to volunteer, this can be a risky thing to say. But the reality is you're doing, you're doing it wrong. You're just like, yeah, I, I gotta teach today or I've gotta serve today. Mm. And I'll be honest, there's times where I'm like, all right, all right, Sunday morning, I, I gotta preach. I've, I've gotta get my head no, on. We're not saying it's always perfect. Right. Or like you but, always feel just like. Right, but you put something forward because of the love you have for God and for his church. And so it's not me getting amped up for Sunday morning. There's times where I come in and I'm like, Lord, I just need your strength. I am super tired. It's been a rough week. And I just, God, I know people want to hear from you today. Can they hear from you? Take me out of this. I'm maybe mm. angry or I'm tired or I'm a little disappointed with something going on. God, can you be present in that? Because what I want to give is your best for them, right? I want them to receive what you have for them. There's a different attitude between that and being like, God, just get me through this morning in what I'm supposed to do. Mm. And I'll be honest, I've had both. I've had both on Sunday mornings. And some people could even say, well, we never could tell the difference. But I could. It's the motivation of the gift. Yeah. And sometimes we say in the foundry, we want your time. We want you to give of your time. We want you to give of your treasure. God calls us to the tithe. And being generous with our finances is an important thing because quite often, what does Jesus say? Money is the root of all evil. A man can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and money. So I think the tithe is a recognition. First of all, God gave me the ability to earn this money and God um, blessed me with the job to earn this. So I'm gonna give back to God what was his in the beginning. It's a sign. It's a symbol of that. Um, we want your time. We want treasure. And we want your talents. We want you to bring what you're best at and share it with us. Because you can do something I can't. Can you imagine me editing a video? Like, <laughs> it would be horrifying. You want to try it sometime? I, no, I super don't because I'm not good at that. I'm terrible at it. But here's the thing. 
we, we, our talents allow us to serve God really effectively. It's back to that violin thing. Maybe shaped like a tennis racket, but you'll ruin it for its purpose if you use it as that. Sometimes we just have certain talents that we are supposed to lean into, and they're supposed to be used in the church. The question is, how do I serve God without getting, getting caught up in religion? It's an attitude of relationship that you're giving to God something he desires and wants of you. Any good gift comes at personal cost, whether it's a gift that takes time or whether it's a gift that costs treasure or whether it's a gift using your talents. The gift matters because of the spirit in which it's given. Even if I said to you, hey, sorry, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't shop, here's, here's five grand, you'd be like, dude, that's awesome, but you sure wouldn't think that I thought much of you in it. Mm. You'd be like, he kind of bought me off because mm -hmm. he felt like a jerk for not thinking of it. It's far, it's far more valuable, like this big gift, like, whoa, that's a big gift. But there's nothing behind it. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I came to you and said, Kyle, I want to give you this $5,000 because I know it's your heart's desire to go up to Alaska and go halibut fishing. And I want to give you this so you have that opportunity. Oh, there's a story. It changes things, yeah. It changes it, right? I don't know why fishing. I'm talking about fishing. Oh, no. yeah, it's halibut yeah. and, and bass. I don't fish that, fish that much. I'm pretty bad Talking at like it. like fishing season. Yeah. <laughs> is, it, is there fishing? Go fishing for deer right now. Oh, I'd totally go fishing <laughs> for deer. Oh, that's awesome. But does that make sense? Yeah. Like, it's, it's not, you don't want to get caught up in religion. Get caught up in serving out of a love for God or a love for his people. Love, love motivates these behaviors. These activities are not benign. They're very active in the kingdom and they're rooted in love. Mm. I also heard, um, speaking of like uh, the, the living waters coming out of people, I watch this yeah. YouTube channel a ton called uh, Living Waters um, like the past couple of months. And uh, basically it's, it's this guy, I don't know if you've heard of Ray Comfort before. No, um, but that's an awesome name. Yeah, it is yeah, pretty sweet. He's got a sweet. nice mustache too. Oh, does he? Um, and he's oh, from New right. Zealand, so he's got a great accent I can't imitate. What, um, what kind? Uh, Australian. Oh, yeah, New really? Zealand. I mean, isn't New Zealand Australia kind of like? No. Oh man, my social yeah. studies. I should yeah, even try. I was, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, the the Kiwis just took great offense. No, they're di they're different, but I mean, they have a different. Yeah. So. Tone. um he, he goes around and he does all of these uh, evangelism videos going around and um, talking to people on the street, anywhere. And I remember there was this one where he was talking to this kid who was like 19, he was a musician, and I know he was interviewing the kid, and the, the kid said like, you know, I, I wanna share my faith more, but I'm just so scared. And he's like, so I've just been praying uh, to God for like, so I'm, <laughs> I've been praying just to not be so afraid to tell people. And then Ray told him, like, well, don't pray for less fear. Pray for more love. Mm. And so now that's what I do. Because I don't know why that just, like, spoke to me so much. But it, maybe this kind of goes back to what we're talking about. Like, you don't, um, you know, if, like, I'll use, like, my, my dad as an example. Like, if my dad tells me not to do something, like, I love my dad. Yeah. Um, and I obey it, it shouldn't be because, like, I'm scared of, like, what the consequences are going to be. Like, if I don't obey this, it should be because I love my dad so much, and I want to show that love by, like, I don't want to say, like, following his rules, but, like, heeding to requests. his guidance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's how our relationship with Christ should be and, and with God. It, we... That's but doesn't it, it also come out of a out of a trust that your dad isn't trying to hurt to you? hold something back from me that he yes. yeah 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 of course so in that way it's like you know when when God steers you away from something you really want you're like why mm -hmm. huh we don't realize what it could turn into that's true but maybe Jesus does well Jesus does and he's probably out of love steering us away not to take from us but to give us life to the full. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, and it, I remember I also heard once, too, there was this teenage kid who, and I won't give a whole lot of context for it, but I remember he shouted out, like, religion's nothing but rules, but Jesus sets you free. And hmm. in that moment, I was like, 
yeah, but like it, it, I was like slightly heartbroken in it too. Mm-hmm. That that's the way people think of like what it is to be a Christian. Like it's just like you, like people who think that going to church is like the only thing that you have to do. Mm-hmm. And it's like no, that's so so missing the big picture. Like that's the one part of it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and I don't don't have a whole lot else to add to that, but. Well, you know, I that's always this, stuck with me. With, with don't pray for less fear, pray for more love. Here's the thing. This is the problem. Hate is not the opposite of love. Hate is a powerful emotional thing. Love is a powerful emotional thing. So they're closer on spectrum than we think. What's the opposite of love? Apathy. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, I couldn't apathy, think of the word. Apathy is complete indifference. Mm. Apathy is walking by someone on the street and la- or not even laughing, not even caring, that they're laying there having a heart attack, having their last moment on earth, and you walk by, and you do not care. You don't care. You're not mad that they got in your way. You're not mm. mad that they're interrupting your day. You're not sad for them. You're not happy that they're having this. You, d- it you feel doesn't, nothing. You feel nothing, and you just go around it, and you keep going. And I would say this. This is the danger in the church. When you do a bunch of things following rules, and you feel like you've done all this stuff, and you've done all the right things, eventually you feel like that's a bank, and you've put all these good behaviors in, and one day you're going to want to cash them out. So what happens when life hits and all your good deeds still land you with a cancer diagnosis? You'd be like, whoa, I did all this good. How can this happen to me? And it becomes a give and take, an exchange relationship, a commodity-based relationship, whereas in relationship, in relationship, in, in, in intimacy, it's not about what did you do for me? I mean, I say this in every wedding ceremony I do. To the husband, I say, you are the witness to the rest of her life. What a privilege mm. for you to get to see the, the, the closeness. You get to know her quirks and these different things. You get to protect, defend, and raise her up to be her very best in life. What a wonderful thing that you're the primary witness of her life going forward. And to the wife, what a wonderful gift that you get to witness all that he is and will become in life. You're the one who knows the closest details of his life. So honor that closeness, right? That's the opposite of apathy. If husbands and wives are like, why didn't you do that? I did it last week. And they fight and bicker based on comparison. There's no love in that. Mm. And eventually they just pass by each other feeling nothing. They're operating and putting a life out there, but they feel nothing. That's a very scary thing. And I feel like in the church, we have a lot of people who just feel nothing. I've been doing all this. I didn't get what I wanted. My life didn't turn out the way I planned. I feel like God failed me. I'm like, God didn't fail you. You put expectations on God that were never biblical. And, and I say that as someone who has had to work through this. And my own wife has said to me, like, you that I can sometimes have a pay your dues theology. I've paid my dues. Why don't I get to do this, right? Mm. It's a really dangerous road to walk down when we find ourselves um, wanting some, some sort of like, I don't know, something for, it's, it's all about us. It becomes internally focused and we lose the context of our own salvation that we were bought out of a miserable, isolated, horrible, lonely place into complete new life in Christ and purposeful life, being used for in a way that we were made for. Like how wonderful is that? How good has God been? So we've gotta be careful with the exchange mentality. I'm gonna do this good thing so that I get this good thing. You know, prosperity doctrine, my only problem. It's like marrying somebody for their money. Yeah. Yeah, it'll end up pretty hollow. But, you know, like I was going to say, my, my only problem with prosperity doctrine that they have, like, you know, sow your seed and God will give you more money. or give you, My only issue with prosperity doctrine is the Bible. <laughs> it doesn't say that. It's not real. 
If Christ called us to take up a cross, I'm pretty sure it wasn't a golden one. You're not going to have everything you want in this life. What you are going to have is the advocate, the Holy Spirit, the gift giver, the Holy Spirit, the, the counselor, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, filling your life and giving purpose and wisdom and vision and opportunity that you can feel. I want to feel like this is an opportunity. We walk by opportunities to share the gospel all the time. The problem is we don't feel anything. We're apathetic, so we don't notice them. And that's the thing that should scare us. Mm. If you're saying, I never have an evangelism opportunity, I would say you need to ask God that question. Mm. God, give me more love. It's one thing if you're too afraid to do it, but if you're never feeling the evangelism opportunity, you're walking by people who are going to go to hell most likely. God died for them, wanted to save them, has brought you close to them, and you're like like walking by with all the feeling of a waffle, just dead inside to what God wants to do. In a relationship with God, when you walk by someone and God kind of pokes you on the heart and he's like, I love them. All of a sudden you look and you notice, you're like, oh my goodness. You notice somebody, you reach out, you connect. You make the effort. That's why we don't want to do good deeds for the sake of good deeds. We want to be in a relationship that, again, the byproduct of knowing Jesus Christ is we do good things. Mm -hmm. But we don't do good things to know Jesus Christ. We do and live differently because we know Jesus Christ. It comes out of that. It doesn't cause us to know Jesus. It's a side effect of mm. knowing Jesus. Okay, we only have a couple of minutes left, but I All had right. one more really good question Like while we're on this topic to ask. So, okay. um, so some people, Christians and non-Christians, are yeah. pretty mean to someone famous when they announce that they've become a Christian. And people tend to focus on how they used to live and act like they can't be Christians, mm -hmm. like our video with the, yeah, the woman right. walking on the right, beach right. and the women talking about her. So some of the examples of this are like Kanye and with Bieber. Yeah. So um, how do we handle those discussions? And isn't that a good time to point out like grace? Oh, yeah. Well, what I would do is like if someone's like ripping on Kanye for becoming a Christian or ripping on Bieber or ripping on Trump, you know, if you don't like Donald Trump, how dare he claim Christianity, right? It's amazing when someone claims a faith that you are like, oh, but I don't like you. Mm -hmm. I don't like you. I, I disagree with you. There was a prostitute who came to a dinner party. And she walked past all the people who were like, why are you here? What do you think you're doing? And she knelt down at the feet of Jesus and she poured her perfume on his feet. She washed his feet with her tears, dried them with her hair. And Jesus, like all these, like, these really stuffy religious types are looking at her like, why are you here? You're gross, unclean, we don't want you here. And Jesus, perceiving the attitude of their heart, literally said to them that this woman has done more for me than you did. For when I came in tonight, you didn't give me anything to wash my feet. You didn't give me anything to refresh myself. Yet since she came in here, she has not stopped kissing my feet and washing them, her, my feet with her hair, her tears and drying them with her hair. So I would go back to the words of Jesus. If there's somebody you don't like and they're a Christian, the problem isn't with them. You, if, and, and here's the thing. There's people I don't like. <laughs> it's just super true. <laughs> There's people I don't like. And if I'm honest, I would rather we not share the same faith. But let's be very clear. That is a desire that comes out of the very worst and darkest part of me. Because that's saying, because you've done some things or there's things about you I don't like, I wish you to be eternally separated from God. I think you unredeemable. I think you beyond the pale of God's grace. I don't know. 
I can't imagine that it's Kanye's fault that there's people who think that dude's messed up and now he's being weird, right? Mm -hmm. Now he's being weird and trying to be Mr. Christian. I think the problem's more in them than it is in Kanye. Mm -hmm. My prayer is for Kanye. Yes, Lord, change him, work through him, help him be an evangelist in his day and age, in his, in his influential sphere, let him be an evangelist and share the gospel. I pray that it's the pure gospel of grace in Jesus Christ. Same thing for Bieber. Like I heard he was leading worship at a church and somebody's like, yeah, can you imagine? I'm like, whoa, mm-hmm. whoa, whoa, go, mm-hmm. have at it. Yeah. Praise God that he's using, I mean, using his gifts and his talents to honor God. I mean, the reason people don't like Christians is for garbage like that, Mm -hmm. where they're like, oh man, I just don't even know if it's real. I would look back and be like, yeah, I don't know either. Like that would be my hard feeling on it. My, My straight up like, why would people not want that? Because they don't like this person for some reason and there's no way this horrible person can believe in Jesus too Mm -hmm. and be saved. I disagree. Fundamentally disagree with that. So when it said, when someone says, you know, like, can you believe Kanye's a Christian? I'm like, I know. Isn't the grace of God amazing? Mm. Aren't you glad that he reached someone in a position where they have a microphone to the world and he's sharing Jesus with people? I just don't know if it's real, man. Go back to the apostle Paul. Go back to the Apostle Paul. I can't quote it chapter and verse. I just know he said this. Whether they're preaching for their own gain or they're preaching for their own, like, you know, their own notoriety, I just celebrate that Christ is being preached. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm at. If they're preaching the gospel, have at it. Like, I'm so thankful for guys like, like Chris Pratt who like, he just loves the Lord. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of people who hate on Chris Pratt. And what's funny is the people who've come to his defense are all the Marvel characters. He's in, you know, like he's ironically being defended by, you know, (laughs) what's the name of him again? I forgot. Avengers. Avengers, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) The Avengers are defending him. Um, But they're like, no, this is a good man. He loves people the way Jesus loved people. I love that we have people in our community of faith that have a pulpit, that have a broad audience. Man, praise God for that. Mm -hmm. Are they perfect? No. If there was cameras following me around 24 seven, pretty sure I'd make some headlines. So here's the reality, they're not perfect people, but praise God they're in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Praise God that there's someone counted among the number of Christ. And my hope would be that their influence globally would lead to many sons and daughters coming to Christ. So if anybody is being graceless and like, can you imagine that they're a Christian now? Here's the thing, check your politics, Check your personal agenda and your own feelings at the door and celebrate the deeper truth that Christ has redeemed someone who bears his image. If your enemies in this world wear flesh and blood, you're fighting the wrong battle. Mm. Every person is created in the image of God. God loves them. He died to save them. Our, as Paul said, our enemy is not of flesh and blood, but it's principalities and power in the powers in the heavenly realm. Our battle is spiritual, and quite often it goes on within us. I think most people right now can identify that, um, especially in the political age we're in, that there are people who we don't want in our camp. There's people who are like, there is no way Joe Biden can be a good Catholic with what he does. There's no way Donald Trump can be a, uh, what did he just say like the other day? He's like, I'm no longer Presbyterian. I believe that I'm more of an evangelical, non-denominational Christian. He flat out said that. Hmm. And there's people on both sides like, there's no way that guy or that guy could ever be a Christian. I refuse to believe that they are. Why? Because you don't want it. Mm -hmm. But don't forget, we are submitted to what God wants. And God wants all of them to come to know him. This isn't a political statement. This is a heart check for us. Mm -hmm. When you're in those discussions, take no pause in clapping back on it and be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why would you think God doesn't love them enough to save them? Well, they've got a messed up past. So you and I are out, Yeah. right? It's pretty good news. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a great question. Yeah. And, um, and that one that says, how do we combat suspicion? 
deal with it inside of you first. Mm -hmm. Why am I suspicious? What do they have? It's pride. It's pride. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, why am I not Chris Pratt? You know? Mm -hmm. I would be more the chunkier one that was Andy (laughs) on Parks and Rec than the new more ripped one. But um, why am I not that? Why don't I get to be that? I think the reality is quite often it's rooted in pride, um, self Self religion and like not self religion, self confidence in the way I live my life. I've followed the rules, so maybe I need God's grace less than Kanye does, mm. or Bieber does, or Biden, or Trump, or whoever you choose to hate and says couldn't be a Christian. Do any of our rules get us closer to God? I mean, mm. this is a really good full circle back to the beginning. Yeah. In the end, it's Christ alone, and He is our all sufficient hope for salvation. In Christ alone do we find our righteousness. And that is the good news of the gospel for us, that it's not up to us and, the, and being good enough. It's up to us believing that Christ is who he said he is, and we can give to him our sin, our shame, and our brokenness. Slide it across the table and just be like, I, I believe that you forgave me. Mm. There's a lot of hope in that. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Well, this was a really, really good conversation. So yeah, man. I think we'll wrap good. it up here. So I'm awesome. glad we got to do this again. And yeah, yeah. Um, I hope that you guys were able to get a lot out of this. And uh, with that said, I guess we'll just wrap it up and say. And do me a favor. Put, uh, I want to find that quote for C.S. Lewis that I used because I, I, I bungled it really bad. Okay. But I'm going to find that, and it's going to be maybe a text screen at the end of this. Okay. Uh, because being a Christian isn't easy. It's, it's very convicting and stuff. But it is wonderful. It is more wonderful and filled with more joy and hope and peace than we could ever share in this world. Mm. It's wonderful. But, but the grace of God bowls us over because it calls out of us some of the most hidden things in our life so that Christ can hold them for us. So we'll get that quote to you. Mm, Perfect. Well, I feel like God answered my prayers. Opening wasn't too bad. Pretty solid. Ending, I feel like it'll be the prayer prayer for next time. (laughs) We'll pray for that next week. (laughs) Thank you for taking the time to listen to us again. We'll catch you later. Have a great week.